All right, let's go, let's go and get started. Um, and for those that don't know me, I'm a school chaplain at Wisconsin Lutheran School. And since, and, and I also have a teaching background. I taught for 10 years before I became a staff minister. And, you know, being a teacher and working in a school, of course, you have to have quizzes, right? And grades. So there will be report cards that will be handed out at the end of the year. Quick pop quiz here. How well do you know the Christmas story? We're going to be going through Luke 2. And a lot of times you get, you know, the Christmas postcards and you get the, uh, vi you know, the, the, the visual images that you get in pictures and stuff like that. And, and sometimes it's hard to separate fact from fiction. What exactly does God's Word tell us? That's, yeah, that's not one of my questions, but that, that, is, that would be a good one. All right, first one. And some of these will be easier than others. First one, who ordered the census? Was it A, Herod, B, Caesar Augustus, C, Joe Biden, <laughs> or D, we don't know? Okay. Get your, keep your answers in, in, you know, in your mind. And, and if you put Joe Biden, you can leave. <laughs> Number two. This one's, a, I think, a little trickier. How many angels first appeared to the shepherds? Is it A, one, B, three, C, a multitude, or D, we don't know for sure? Okay. Number three, who was governor of Syria when the census was taken? Is it A, Quirinius, B, Herod, C, Tony Evers, or D, we don't know for sure? Number four, what did the innkeeper say to Mary and Joseph? A, we have no room in the inn. B, you can stay in the stable. C, what are you doing here? Or D, we don't know for sure. And number five, how did Mary and jo Joseph get to Bethlehem? A, they walked. B, rode donkeys. C, Joseph walked while Mary rode a donkey. Or D, we don't know for sure. All right. Number one, who ordered the census? Caesar Augustus. It was Caesar Augustus. That, yep. Number two, how many angels first appeared to the shepherds? One talked, but we don't know how many were there with it. I think it was just the one, because otherwise they were going to be so scared. The only ones. They were terrified. Yes, they were. Everybody's going to go with one? Any other answers? It's one. Yeah, because it says an angel appeared to the shepherds, and then a multitude came, right? But it gets you thinking, yeah, what does the, yeah, okay, here's, here's a, 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 I think, the toughest question. Who was governor of Syria? No. Well, we don't know for sure. This, I, I was in, in the People's Bible. When, when I was reading in the People's Bible, um, and, and putting this together, I didn't know this, but um, this is like the, the Bible critics, you know, the people that are trying to disprove the Bible and whatever. Uh, they'll say that Quirinius wasn't governor of Syria because they do have records saying that he began governor around uh, 10 years after Herod. So that's where the Bible critics are saying, oh, so the Bible's wrong. Quirinius wasn't really governor during that time. However, in the People's Bible it says, quite possible that he had two terms or, or whatever, like maybe he was governor, because it's it, it makes a good point in saying the first census, yeah. you know, another possibility in the people's Bible, what they say is with the Greek word of first could also mean prior. So it could be read as the census prior to Quirinius being governor. So there is a possibility that Quirinius wasn't really governor at that time. Most likely he was, but we don't know for sure. 
So that we don't know for sure is the right answer. But most likely he was. Uh, number five, what did the innkeeper say to Mary and Joseph? We don't know for sure. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't tell us. And, and how did Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem? That's, that's how it's typically pictured in the uh, Christian art, isn't it? We don't know for sure, right? Because the Bible doesn't say, you know, they could have just walked. Maybe somebody let them use a donkey. You know, who knows? But, uh, yeah, the Bible doesn't say for sure. All right, so let's get into our Bible study. It's, it's Luke chapter 2. Yeah. Yeah, that, that could be. a staple, and they actually had, you know, a setup for him in the cave, and he saw some other stuff. Yeah. If you look at the topography of the area, though, a lot of the caves were used to safeguard the animals that are. That's quite possible. It's quite possible. Um, and, and wood wasn't necessarily as in abundance, you know? So. Yeah, and, and, and also it's, it's interesting, uh, Professor Brug, I don't know if you guys heard him give his spiel on the EHV. Mm -hmm. One thing that he said, they were gonna drop manger and change it to like feeding trough. Mm -hmm. And when they were giving their spiel up in Northern Wisconsin, some of the dairy farmers were like, why would you do that? That's what we still call it. So that term, Manger is still being used by dairy farmers still today. So, whatever, yeah, that feeding trough. So it's like we'll keep using it. So that was yeah, that was kind of an interesting. Have this say, the <laughs> <laughs> Just doesn't have the same ring, does it? Yeah. <laughs> so why do we always go to Luke chapter two? You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels, um, give a historical account of Jesus, you know, his life, his teachings, his death, his miracles, his resurrection. But Luke seems to have the most uh, detailed account of Christmas. And why do you suppose that would be? You know what? Most likely, yeah. right? Because she kept all those things and pondered them. In her heart, exactly. Yeah, you know that uh, when Luke begins his gospel, he, he talks about how, you know, he, he never had actually met Jesus. He became a Christian later. And he wanted a, to put together a thorough account. And then he talked about how he investigated carefully everything about Jesus. So like a good historian, you, you want to go to the sources. You want to go to the people. And, and he doesn't say that he talked to Mary, but as you read Luke 2, you, you, you almost feel like you're reading everything from Mary's perspective. Like this is Mary's story. Um, why don't we do the first seven verses if somebody wants to read that. And those who were with him were Verses 1 and 2 note the specific historical references that Luke supplies to pinpoint the Savior's birth and time. This was a real event, not made up for one reason or another. Caesar Augustus ruled over the Roman world from 27 B.C. to A.D. 14. You know what B.C. and A.D. stand for? 
Yeah, something like that. And then, yeah, you're the Lord, right? Uh, there is this. There is a secular reference dated A.D. 14 that Quirinius ruled in Syria. So, like ten years after Herod died, Quirinius ruled up there. Um, and, and there's a there's a good there's. It's quite likely that it's off. Like A.D. year of the, the Lord wasn't actually year zero, because they they didn't start dating like that until, um, oh after what's-his-face, the Roman leader who legalized Christianity, Constantine. Yeah, after Constantine legalized Christianity, that's when they started using the, the, the years, and they used the year zero, but he was off by a couple of years, most likely. So, not that it matters. But anyway, um, a census was taken to count the country's population and to establish a basis for taxation. And I know kids, when you do the Christmas story, now, they have no clue what, what a census is and what's the purpose of a census. We just had one last year. Yeah. And, and you think about, uh, you know, from the, the Roman government perspective, it, it, it helped with uh, having a good understanding of the empire. And I need X number of dollars or whatever the Roman coinage was. And, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, make sure our military is in the right places. We need to make sure we're getting, especially for taxes, the, the, the right amount of revenue we should be expecting. To, oh, we got that many people living in Jerusalem. Well, we should get this much taxes back. All right. Number one, what amazing conclusion must you come to regarding Mary and Joseph being in Bethlehem at the very time of Jesus' birth? When else would the nine-month pregnant woman travel from way up here to way down there on a donkey anymore? Yeah, I don't care if it was on a donkey or a camel. I, I, I suppose camels could have been one of those questions or possible answers too, but uh, yeah, you're nine months pregnant. You're not going to wanting be wanting to do that kind of traveling, and it's 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 a yeah. It's about a ninety mile trip. So was that about to yeah. Chicago or Madison, maybe? As the crow flies, it's about sixty, but they wouldn't go through Samaria, so. <laughs> So, but yeah, because it was prophesied, right? What's that? Oh, yeah. It probably take them a while at that kind of stage. And that also explains why everybody else had taken up all the rooms in the inn <coughs> by the time they got there. But it's a reminder that God is in control, right? God is in control of all things. <coughs> you know, and, and also it, it, it's kind of cool how um, God controls all things. You know, like in Galatians 4, when the time had fully come, God said to Son, you know, the, the, the timing was just right. It was perfect. You know, everything, when you look at, you know, God's hand and over the whole setting, how perfect it is. You know, because... You know, it's, it's, it's during Roman peace. You know, I mean, and, and like years before this, you know, when, when Alexander the Great had kind of swept through the Mediterranean world, he set up the system of learning and started the tenets of Western civilization as we have it today. You know, this emphasis on learning, schools. And he started mixing the people around you know, taking Jews and moving them to different parts of the Mediterranean world. And as they would go to different places, they would bring with them, you know, the uh, you know, copies of the Bible, and, and they would set up their places for, you know, like schools and places of worship, which would be synagogues. You know, that's where the synagogues started popping up all around the, the, the Jewish world. And the Bible, the Old Testament, got translated in from Hebrew 
into Greek. And so you get these Greek Bibles all around and you get that common language of Greek. You know, so all the people in the Mediterranean world during the Greek Empire had that common language. The Jews would still hold on to their Hebrew, but Greek would become the common language for learning and for speaking. Um, and then when the Romans took over, they kept all that learning and philosophy and all that Greek stuff. But then, you know, their strengths were like building, building great roads, right? Soldiers to, soldiers to protect. So now, when the time had fully come, we got this time of peace, great transportation system, common language. I mean, it was just perfect setting for the gospel to, to just explode. So that by the end of the first century, we see that good news as far north as the United Kingdom, southern parts of Africa, as far west as Spain, and through India and into the footsteps of China. And, and you know, I mean, it's incredible how, you know, God saw to it that the gospel would just explode throughout that region. And it's also amazing how, you know, the, you know, having Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem kind of also helped with a, some practical purposes as well, because Really, they're having a child out of wedlock. What would that be like for the for for the family? You know, if they're if they're back in Nazareth, the neighbors, everybody else, that's a scandal. You know, and so now having Mary and Joseph down in Bethlehem having the child, and they don't go back to Beth Nazareth until yeah, because because where do they go from Bethlehem? You know, and, and that was also kind of part of God's plan, right? And also fulfills prophecy as well out of Egypt, you call my son. And, uh, you know, and, and so when Mary and Joseph head back to Nazareth, by then Jesus is like four years old. I mean, they might even already have another kid or so, who knows? But yeah, you can just see God. And, and, and then God sends the wise men, right, bringing those gifts. And what, what do they do with those gifts? Well, they probably use that to fund their trip to Egypt. You know, how cool. You know, every step of the way, God controls all things and making sure that, yeah. We sometimes hear the devil's in the details. And here's a reminder, God's in the details. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, most of our the Christmas movies, like It's a Wonderful Life and Christmas Story, yeah, they, 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 don't, they, they seem to miss some of the really good stuff, don't they? Um, all right, number two. Jesus was a king, yet he came in humility. For his kingdom would be won not by force of arms, but by offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. How does the beginning of Jesus' life set the pace for the rest of his life. He never really had a home. Never really had a home. I mean, yes, when he was a child. Where should he have been born? If he, I mean, if, if you think of it in a, from an earthly perspective, a castle. right? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the is born. Yeah, yeah, in Jerusalem or Rome, you know, I mean, yeah. in a castle, passel, servants, silk sheets, right? Yeah. Yeah. When he dies, from the clothes he has, even those are taken from him. No home, right? Yeah, where's the pa pastor's foxes have holes? The son of man, he never had a home. I mean, growing up, I'm sure he had home, but not like he himself had any possessions or a wife or anything. 
But yeah, this is this, you know, a stage of humiliation. That humble boost. Set, setting the stage of Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. This is why he's here. You know, I was talking with my catechism class about this. Uh, you know, Tuesday was our last day before break. And, you know, when, when we think of the sacrifice of Jesus, you know, you think about what that is. You know, we, we, we usually think of the cross, right? Because it, it, it is the ultimate sacrifice, shedding his body, his blood. But really, the sacrifice started when he went from heaven to earth, right? To willingly give up your divine power and glory. To set it aside. I mean, he went from being in heaven and surrounded by angels and praise and glory to, yeah, that, that humble birth, that laying in that manger. You know, to give up your power. I mean, who willingly does that? I remember, gosh, just a few months ago, I had rotator cuff surgery, and uh, I had to, yeah, I had to have a sling on my right arm. It was my right arm, so I could not use my right arm for like six weeks, and I'm still not back, you know. But I couldn't drive my car for six weeks, and that was hard, you know. I, having Helen drive me around all the time. Oh gosh, I mean that was the worst thing. I mean, there were things like, yeah, I couldn't shave, couldn't br brush my teeth, I had to use my left hand, you know, for everything. But not driving was the hardest thing, you know, and, 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 and to, to, to give that up. Now you think of what Jesus, you know, to go, up, go from God. I mean, he's still God. You know, he's the God man. But he set aside that divine power. He set aside all of that. A helpless baby, and, and it, it's just mind-boggling. One of my favorite Christmas hymns. I, I really don't know if I've heard it too much this Christmas season, but Mary, did you know? You know, it, 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 I just love how some of the lyrics in that come together. Like, you know, Mary, did you know that when you kissed your baby boy, you kissed the face of God? Right, you're holding that baby. Um, Christmas morning and you're going through him all things were made. Right? I mean this is God himself who made the heavens and the earth. This is God himself who fills the universe. And we're holding him in our arms. Right? We're wiping his diapers. We're watching him crawl on the ground. This is maybe that's a sacrifice. Hey, what, a, what a sacrifice that is to give it all up. And not like he just came down to earth and as a grown man and, 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 and got hung on the cross. I mean, it was like his whole life. It was 30 years he's growing up like that. Any other thoughts on these first seven verses? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, that was one thing I missed this year. Yeah. He sings it without accompanying. Cool. Very, very good. Yeah. And he was here. He was here. Yeah. Next to. All right. Eight through twenty. Um, why don't we divide it in two parts? Some of you want to read 8 through 14, and then somebody else 15 through 20. Thank you. you will find a baby wrapped in a cloak and a baby 
20. So what are the two possible reactions to the glory of the Lord? You're either going to be terrified like the shepherds were, or you're going to be either terrified or at peace and comforted and excited. What makes a difference in what reaction a person has? Well, when you know you're a sinner, if you're facing something directly from God, you've got to be scared. Because you know, oops, yeah. I don't deserve to be here. So, you know, yeah, you know, you know, it's like, it's, I think yeah. you can have both of those reactions at the same time, right. too. Yeah. Sure. Why, what, what would give us the peace? Knowing that God's plan is being carried out now. Yeah. Forgiveness. Knowing that, yeah, we're, we're forgiven, right? That our, our standing with God is good because of Jesus. So I would assume it would be like that on judgment day. If you're still alive, it's going to be, oh, happening right. and it's scary but for us it'd be like yeah. right you know, hard to picture what judgment day is going to be like you know, it's just, but it's exciting to think about isn't it you know, how cool that's going to be all the angels appearing all at once you know the sky ripping open and Lord coming through with all of his angels and all the people being gathered together, surrounding him in the air, like gravity ceasing to exist, right? Just caught up together. Yeah. Trumpet call. Yeah. Will we be terrified? So there will be some that will run out to meet him and others will run away from him. Try to, right? Yeah. I visit Jim What's that? I visit Jim Bureau, and she talks a lot about that. She said she would really like to be here when Jesus comes. And she, she did, this is what she said. She would like this girl to walk in there. She's a neat lady. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, is it possible to be terrified on Judgment Day? I mean, I'm guessing, because we still have that sinful nature, but... We'd say, what's going on here? Yeah. Well, it's not the 4th of July. Why is that going to happen so fast? Like, what, what the actual time we have? I mean, it's going to be the blink of an eye. Yeah. 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 And, and as soon as that change takes place, then that sinful, I mean, because it's the sinful nature that's going to cause us to be terrified, right? It's because sinful nature is always going to be pointing to ourselves, and, and that guilt is going to be strong. But our, our new man, it's going to be excited, it's going to be thrilled. And, man, all that's in that way. It's not like we're going to have to wait more than for a hundred years to find out what our final destination is going to be. Yeah. Nice to know it's going to go fast. So this shows that also who really the God's 
gospel is intended for. In a sense, the shepherd is for the lowliest people, so it's the lowliest all the way up. Doesn't matter how poor and lowly you are, the gospel still is intended for you. You know, well, that's a great segue to that very next question. Why do you think God announced the birth of his son first to shepherds? Right? Isn't that, isn't that such a cool cool way of looking at it? Because he, had, he came for the lowly. Right? He came not just for the kings and princes, but for the lowly, for the humble. Yeah. Shepherding wasn't a glamorous job. No. Shepherding was a no. No. Right? We'll go watch a bunch of dumb sheep. Yeah. They can be smelling. They can smell it. Yeah. 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 You know, gotta protect them. Lions. When you work with them long enough, they just smell like them. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's who, who they came to. And then the last question, how did each of the following react when they heard about the Savior? The shepherds, how did they react to the good news? They left their sheep and said, let's go check this out. Right? And, and they told everybody, right? How about the people they spoke to? What was their reaction when they heard what the shepherds had to say? They were all amazed. They were all amazed. And then Mary? treasure, you know, I mean, you think of moments that you treasure in your life, you know, this is what she treasured, you know, all of these moments of bonding. And, and what, what a great, I guess, way of looking at, you know, this is what we should be doing too, shouldn't it? Treasuring up this good news. Being amazed at the good news that he would do this. And then like the shepherds to go and proclaim the two years, all three. Any other thoughts on these first 20 verses? What was that? Any other thoughts on these first 20 verses? I guess I think about Mary being chosen as she did. And then how she has the parts of the puzzle now, but really has to keep on pondering yeah. 33 years before all the puzzle pieces fit together. And, and maybe even a little bit beyond that. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. yeah, so many, like the disciples, mm -hmm. how they got all these pieces, but it wasn't until Pentecost that it all came together. It's kind of a definition of faith then too. You know, God chose me, but I don't know all the stuff that all this is all going to work out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think you see any evidence in the Bible either before she got to work on it, but the job was going to be off. She didn't feel that way. Well, she felt, I she mean, felt chosen, but chosen, all nations will call me blessed, you know, or blessed, you know, how fortunate she was. Yeah, we were watching the uh, church yesterday with uh, the, the, the pictures that Pastor used. And, you know, was one in particular had Mary and Joseph with heels, and Helen was quick to point out, hey, <laughs> that one looks a little Catholic to me. <laughs> but could we see ourselves with halos? Sure, right? I mean, because we are forgiven, right? We are sinners, but we're also saints. But anyway, but we just don't, yeah, we don't don't look at Mary the same way the Catholics do. Well, let's uh, get into 21 to 35 of Luke 2. We'll just go for another 10 minutes or so. Um, why don't we split this up uh, 
21 to 21 to 20, about 21 to 32. I think that's a little long. How about 21 to 27? All right, I'll read that. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. And does anyone want to read uh, up to 35? Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, and now this is your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people as well. Kind of hard to read that and not sing it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the child's father and mother Marvel. Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and the sword will be pierced to your own soul too. All right. So, what is the law regarding circumcision? When, you, when did that start? Abraham. Yeah. God choosing Abraham to be the father of his nation. That he was to be circumcised. And uh, every child after that was to be circumcised. And, and, and is that necessary today? Why not? Yeah. And... Uh, Needed to be on the eighth day. And why the eighth day? That was uh, part of the, I guess, the Levitical law where a woman is unclean for seven days when she has, you know, her um, monthly discharges and a baby is considered to be a discharge. And so you're, or a, a lot of discharge happens when you have a baby as well. And so uh, you to wait till after she's clean and the next day you go have the child uh, taken to uh, the temple and uh, have him circumcised. Um, and then uh, um, well, actually I don't know. Do you have to go to the temple to be circumcised? Yeah, I suppose it would be anywhere. Yeah. But the offering had to be done at the temple. But then again, I, yeah, I suppose if you're living far away. Yeah. The muscle. But they would, uh, the offering would be done after 40 days. So 33 days after the uh, circumcision. And, and kind of cool how you see that number 40 quite a bit in the Bible, don't you? And uh, the offering was to be like a sheep or a goat. But if you were poor, what could you bring? Yeah, doves or pigeons. 
So it kind of tells us a little bit about Mary and Joseph, right? And it also tells us that, uh, yeah, obviously the wise men hadn't come yet. Because by then they easily could have afforded a sheep or a goat, right, with all the stuff that had been brought. Um, I think number one, we kind of, well, what do Mary and Joseph's activities at this time, going through the circumcision, the purification, what does this show us about them? Very faithful Jews. Yeah. Right. Jesus had to fulfill the law and make sure he did it. Yep. God knew what he was doing when he chose them to be the parents of Jesus. Right. Number two, how did Simeon, at exactly the right time, know what to do and what to say? The Holy Spirit came upon him, right? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus would be light and glory. Explain those words and how they were applied to the two main groups of people in the world, Jews and Gentiles. How about light to the Gentiles? How would he be light to the Gentiles? Because it kind of implies that the Gentiles were in the dark. Right? He didn't know much of the promises. I mean, they, they definitely had the opportunity to know him. I mean, but they knew that the Messiah would come from the Jews. They knew some things about God's plan of salvation. But for the most part, they were in the dark, and Jesus would be the light for them. And, and then Jesus makes that pretty clear later in life, doesn't he? I am the light of the world, you know, and and and, uh, and you know, uh, he is he is our light as well. That uh, sin has blinded us, and because of sin, we're not able to appreciate the ways of God and all that He's done for us. And through the gospel, we see the light. Through the gospel, we see what God has done for us. How about glory? How is He? Glory for the people of Israel, for the Jews. The Jews were the chosen people, and by the fact that he finally came from the Jews, yeah, yeah. it was like, yes. He is, he is here. We, yeah, God trusted us, and we yeah. were able to get to this point. Unfortunately, we're still waiting. Kind of like being a Bucks fan. Right, you know, I mean, for 50 <laughs> years you're waiting and you're waiting, and you're, you, and probably so many people saying, "Why are you still cheering for that team? You know, why don't you cheer for the Bulls like in the 90s or, or the Lakers and, and, and then the finally, or the Cubs, <laughs> and then it's finally fulfilled, right? They, they win their championship and you have that glory. Yeah, that's our team. And that's the, you know, Jesus." Conquering Satan, sin, and death. He did it. That's our king. And yet you have how they tried to destroy the light. Well, and that's that's what I think that's the very next question, right? The the rising and the falling. Right? Because for many, this is a rising, right? He is the rock. He's the cornerstone of the church. On him the church is built. Every believer is added to that is like a stone built upon the cornerstone right Ca causing us to rise but he also causes many to fall so like Palm Sunday Good Friday would be the personification of that right where they rise up to greet him singing his praises yeah and then a few days later crucify him and yeah, you know, causing them to fall because on the last day, yeah, they're not going to be able to stand, are they? Um, so 
So, what do Sidney's ominous words to Mary mean? That a sword will pierce your own soul too. Would it be specific enough to say that she would actually physically see her son be pierced with the spear and she would be there? Her mom feels what her kids feel, that, that she was going to actually witness it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is it's talking about that heartbreak. Absolutely, seeing your son going through that's got to be even. You know, and, uh, did she know, you know, that him dying on the cross during that time was the victory for herself, or was she just totally caught up with seeing her son going through that pain? Obviously, the pain has got to be huge. To see him go through that. Uh, last one, real quick here. The new diminis. You now you are dismissing. You now dismiss. Why is that such a fitting ending to the Lord's Supper? You know, that, like what Bill read there, you know, verses 29 to 31. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. Light for revelation of the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Why is that such a fitting ending to the sacrament of Holy Communion? Holy Communion is that tangible evidence that it's in the world. It's not just a sign. And picture what Simeon's going through. Right? How long had he been waiting to see Jesus? Now what is he ready to do? Right? How awesome this is. I just got to see the Savior. I got to see the Messiah. I got to see the Christ. How cool this is that God has let me have this. Okay, Lord. You know, how long? You know, thank you for this tremendous gift. And, that, and isn't that the same feeling that we are to have at communion? How cool this is that we are receiving this gift. You know, that you have given this to me to share in your body and your blood and, and how you have done this for, for me. Yeah. There we go. All right, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Lord and Savior, this Christmas and always, we just are mindful of the tremendous sacrifice that you have given us, how you went from heaven to earth to pay the tremendous price for our sins, to live the perfect life that we cannot live. And, and Lord, we, we ask that you be with us in worship this morning. Turn our hearts and minds to you and, and, and your plan of salvation and keep us close to you always till that glorious day when you return take us home. In your name we pray. Amen.